Okay, good morning. Uh, I'll be discussing on uh, approach to diagnosis and the management of chronic coronary syndrome. So my lecture is basically uh, targeted towards uh, junior residents. And um, to start with the definition, uh, as you all know, coronary disease is a pathological process that's characterized by atherosclerosis accumulation in epicardial arteries, whether it can be obstructive or non-obstructive. And it can have uh, different variable clinical features. Uh, one is uh, it can be a long standing and stable uh, period, or it can be unstable at any time due to an acute atherothrombotic event. So uh, although we can say it, has, uh, it can be stable, uh, over a long period, uh, it's a dynamic process. So, uh, that's why recently there is a reclassification of the stable coronary artery disease as chronic coronary syndrome. Uh, uh, so uh, when we see the natural history of uh, chronic coronary syndrome, based on the intervention, uh, and the degree of intervention, either with lifestyle modification, uh, medical therapy, or, uh, uh, or, or, or interventions like revascularization. So the clinical feature or the natural history course may vary. So you can see here three lines and uh, with early revascularization on the bottom line or with uh, uh, lowering the risk after optimally controlled risk factors and the lifestyle management. And then in the upper uh, or the red line, it is more with insufficient uh, intervention. Uh, so natural course might differ based on the degree of intervention in, 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 in those patients. And in 2019, the European Society of Cardiology uh, has revised uh, the uh, components or the clinical scenarios in stable coronary artery disease, which was reclassified as chronic coronary syndrome. So um, there are uh, six clin clinical scenarios. Uh, and in this discussion, I'll be focusing mainly on the first one. Uh, so I'll not discuss about heart failure and the rest, or the microvascular disease and so on. But so I will be focusing on someone who presents with angina and then how to approach in those uh, instances. So to start with, uh, uh, this is a case, uh, 75 year old female who presented with uh, chest pain of one month's duration and uh, the patient characterized it as tightness of chest, a left shoulder on walking. And uh, the pain is when she rested and uh, she did not seek medical help at first, but uh, she experienced the same pain while walking three days ago. And, and it was replicable. Uh, so now the first question is, what should be included in the clinical assessment of uh, this patient? So if somebody presents with uh, such history, so there are uh, things to be included in the uh, history, like the ones that are important are the age and sex of the patient, which are important in the uh, pretest probability or uh, determining clinical likelihood of uh, coronary artery disease. The pain and characteristics and factors that provoke and relieve the pain, associated symptoms, history of cardiovascular disease, uh, if there is any previous event, uh, like previous history of uh, ischemic heart disease, and then cardiovascular risk factors. These are important in the history. And uh, in physical examination, again, uh, identifying cardiovascular risk factors, looking for signs of uh, other cardiovascular disease and uh, excluding other uh, possible causes of angina that uh, arise from uh, either from the muscle or from the valves like severe arctic stenosis or cardiomyopathy. And the other is other cause of chest pain. Now in that patient, uh, in the case, so do you suspect stable angina? So there is a criteria to define uh, a stable angina. So one of these uh, is uh, a, class a classification based on uh, uh, three of those characteristics. So the first is the quality of the pain. So 
constricting discomfort you know, of the chest that radiates. And then the second uh, criteria or characteristics is uh, the precipitant. So in the, if it is, it's usually on physical exertion and then relieved by rest or nitrous. So if somebody fulfills three, these three uh, characteristics, it is classified as typical angina. If two of these three are uh, uh, fulfilled, then it is atypical angina. If uh, it meets only one or none of those characteristics, it is non-anginal uh, chest pain. Now in the uh, previous case, in the case that I, uh, I described, so the patient has uh, constricting discomfort in the chest and shoulders, and it was precipitated by physical exertion and it was relieved by rest. So it is a typical angina. So the patient presented with typical angina and there are factors that make stable angina more likely in, in such patients. So one is age. Now, with increasing age, now in that patient, it was 75 years. And male sex, and the presence of cardiovascular risk factors, history of established coronary artery disease, this make the likelihood of uh, stable angina uh, higher. And it is unlikely to, to be stable angina if the pain is continuous or very prolonged and or unrelated to activity. And if it is brought on by breathing, associated with dizziness, palpitations, tingling, difficulty swallowing, these characteristics make stable angina less likely in, in somebody who presents with chest, chest pain. Uh, now, this is in somebody with uh, stable angina, and then uh, you can classify, like similar to that of uh, heart failure, there is a way of classifying the, uh, the severity. Uh, so one from one to four, and the way to classify it is similar to that of uh, New York uh, function, functional uh, classification on based on New York Heart Association, uh, whether it occurs on strenuous activity, on moderate exertion, on mild exertion, or angina at rest. Uh, now, after the clinical assessment, and then we can classify patients into three categories. So one is, does the patient have confirmed coronary artery disease? Now, in, in the previous case, it was not uh, confirmed coronary. Does the person have non anginal chest pain? And uh, uh, so stable angina is not suspected based on history and risk factors. Now, in, in the case, more fits to the uh, typical angina. So this, the clinical uh, case scenario is that of uh, uh, typical angina in our case. So you can classify into these three categories. Uh, if somebody has confirmed uh, coronary artery disease, then you can just proceed with uh, in, in that, uh, in somebody who presents with typical chest pain, and then you can proceed it, it as uh, stable angina and treat based on, on, on the treatment uh, regimens uh, for stable angina. Uh, but if somebody is uncertain in, in somebody who has confirmed coronary artery disease, if somebody is uncertain whether it is uh, angina or not, then the next thing is to do non-invasive functional imaging. Uh, we will discuss what these are. Or exercise ECG testing in places where we don't have non-invasive functional imaging. Uh, if the person has non-angina chest pain, so this is the second category, uh, and the stable angina is not suspected, then we have to uh, work up the patient on uh, non, uh, like non-coronary, or we have to consider other causes other than cardiac, like GI or musculoskeletal pain, and probably we might uh, take chest X-ray in, in such patients. And if it is typical angina, like in our case, then we proceed to the uh, investigations and there are some basic biochemical testings. Uh, one is uh, CBC, full blood count, uh, renal function test, and uh, lipid profile. And the other is workup for diabetes, including uh, fasting plasma glucose and hemoglobin A1C. And assessment of thyroid function is also important. So these are class one recommendations in somebody who has who presents with typical angina and the other is uh, ecg so uh, resting ecg is also recommended in in such patients uh, 
uh, and it's, it has strong evidence. I mean, it's a strong recommendation. That's class one recommendation. And resting echocardiography or probably cardiac MRI might be considered in some instances. And, and echocardiography is to for exclusion of alternative causes or identification of regional wall motion abnormalities, measurement of LV ejection fraction and uh, evaluation of the diastolic function. So uh, main uh, indication for echocardiography is for uh, for for this uh, uh, at least to characterize this this uh, fun cardiac functions. And in some instances, uh, ultrasound of the carotid arteries might be uh, required. And this, the level of the class of evidence for uh, CMR is lower, uh, but it is indicated in, in, in patients in whom the echocardiographic test is uh, not conclusive. Chest X-ray, as we said, it is uh, in patients with atypical presentation or, or when there is uh, heart failure, symptoms of heart failure, or if we suspect pulmonary disease. Now, in the previous patient, this is the ECG. Uh, and as uh, you might, uh, you can see, this is a normal ECG. Now, the next is, the resting ECG is normal. So then the next uh, step would be to estimate the likelihood of coronary artery disease in such patients. So this is a patient who presents with, this, with typical uh, angina or typical chest pain and uh, ECG is resting ECG is normal. So then the likelihood of coronary artery disease would be determined based on or estimated based on some uh, scenario. So the 12 ECG does not help us to rule out stable angina if it is normal. So if it is normal, then we have to proceed with the uh, other like clinical history and risk factors. And, uh, and ECG results may not be conclusive, but if there are some changes, in the ECG, like if there is pathological key wave, left bundle branch block, or S segment and key wave abnormalities, mm -hmm. and in such patients, in such scenarios, in such cases, we may that it may indicate ischemia. Mm -hmm. uh, doctor, okay. So shall I proceed? Yes, proceed, doctor. Sorry, okay. I, I will uh, mute them. Okay, good. So in, in our patient, it was a typical chest pain and we have suspect stable angina and resting ECG is normal. Now we use a clinical assessment, the ECG and the typicality of the angina to estimate the likelihood of coronary artery disease. Now here again, there are three classifications, either less than 10, more than 90% or 10 to 90%. So we can categorize uh, or uh, the patients based on the estimation of the, the likelihood or the pretest probability into these three categories. And, and then uh, the pretest probability based on these three, the age, the typicality of angina and the sex can be decided uh, or, or can be estimated based on this table. I took this table from Euro European Society of Cardiology. So this is one of the categorizations and and some in, in, in this scenario, so in our case, it, it falls into that category of 10 to 90% in, in our case. So it's a typical angina and age is 75 and uh, female sex and ECG was normal. So it falls into the 10 to 90% uh, likelihood of coronary artery disease. Now, sometimes uh, there are things that might uh, increase or decrease the likelihood of coronary artery disease, normal ECG or, and if CT is done, so cardiac CT is done or coronary CT is done, then if there is no coronary calcium, and that means Augustan score of zero, then it makes the likelihood uh, lower. And things that increase the likelihood are risk factors for cardiovascular disease. If there are resting ECG chains, LV dysfunction uh, suggestive for coronary uh, artery disease, and abnormal exercise ECG, ECG if it is done, and if there is uh, coronary calcium by CT, that increases the likelihood of uh, uh, coronary artery disease. So some of the other classifications, uh, like excellence from the UK, adds those uh, uh, the, the risk factors into the categories, 
and and then this will raise the the likelihood of coronary artery disease in those with risk factors. So this is a different um, classification system uh, or for the pretest probability. Now in our case, uh, women older than seventy, so the estimate is like sixty-one to ninety percent. In in our case, based on the this different classification. Uh, and then now, uh, if the estimated likelihood is more than 90% and person has features of typical angina, and then uh, we can proceed with other investigations to test for conditions that exacerbate angina and patient has to be started on uh, treatment for stable angina immediately with no further diagnostic tests. And if it is less than 10%, and then we have to consider other causes of chest pain and probably x-ray might be required in such patients and we have to investigate other causes of angina like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In our case it was 10 to 90 percent so uh, now the next step is to do other blood tests and we have to start aspirin on this patient aspirin on, because the, the likelihood of angina is higher it was like 60 to 90 percent in this case and uh, we can start uh, the patient on, uh, I mean, we can treat the patient as stable angina while awaiting the other uh, investigations. And uh, <clears throat> now we can reclassify. Now it was 10 to 90%. If we can't confirm stable angina in such patients, then we can like proceed with other investigations. Now, if it is the diagnostic test is 10 to 9, 29%, 30 to 60%, and 61 to 90%. So we can again classify these patients into three categories. Like uh, in this case, it was like because of the age uh, and the likelihood of uh, uh, the pretest probability, the, our patient falls into 61 to 90%, but we will see each of the three categories. Now, if it is 10 to 90% in the lower range of the pretest probability, uh, or then, and then the investigation modality that is chosen is CT. So it's coronary CT, CT and uh, then calcium scoring is 10. And if uh, it is zero, and then we go again to other cause of chest pain. If it is more than 400, uh, considered as high, that of higher likelihood, 61 to 90%. And if it is in between, and then uh, CT coronary angiography is done and, 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 and the significance of the coronary artery disease is then determined. Uh, if it is 30 to uh, 60%, uh, non-invasive functional imaging is the next uh, modality of investigation. Uh, to see if there is a reversible myocardial ischemia. So uh, if there is no reversible myocardial ischemia or no ischemia at all, and then we have to proceed with uh, other cause of chest pain. If, it is, uh, if there is a reversible myocardial ischemia, then the patient is diagnosed to have stable angina. If it is uncertain, and then the next step would be invasive coronary angiography. So the non-invasive functional imaging is to see if there is any uh, myocardial ischemia, and if that is reversible. Then based on the invasive coronary angiography, uh, the significance of the coronary artery disease is again determined uh, to either treat a stable angina or investigate other cause of the chest pain. The non-invasive functional testing that we were, so for uh, non-invasive testing, so one is CT scan, which we see, for, it is basically for anatomic, uh, uh, characterization, either calcium scoring or the uh, the coronary angiography. The others are the, the non-invasive functional testing. This include uh, myocardial uh, perfusion scintigraphy with uh, like uh, single photon emission computer tomography, which is now combined with SPECT CT with CT scan, and or the, the other is a PET, of course, uh, positron emission tomography. The second is stress echocardiography and, and my, uh, my, I mean magnetic resonance uh, contrast enhanced uh, perfusion uh, scanning 
or uh, MR imaging for stress induced wall motion abnormalities. So these three, either echocardiography, that is stress, echo, SPECT or nuclear imaging and magnetic resonance imaging as the three non-invasive functional testing modalities. Now, uh, the, uh, whether we can do this or not depends on the availability and the, the expertise. And uh, if there is no expertise, of course, the next step would be to do exercise ECG. Uh, so we base uh, our decision based on uh, exercise ECG if uh, there is no uh, functional, uh, non-invasive functional testing. Like in our case, uh, probably we can resort to exercise ECG in, if we can't do stress echo. And of course, although there is uh, preparation, I mean, processes are going on to acquire respect CT, it's not yet uh, material, materialized. Now, uh, if it is in the higher range, 61 to 90%, and then we, decide if invasive coronary angiography is appropriate and acceptable or uh, and coronary revascularization is being considered. So based on the symptoms and the response uh, or the, the, the non-invasive functional testing, pro probably we can proceed with the uh, invasive coronary angiography. So we can uh, decide on whether to uh, proceed to it or not. And if it is not appropriate, for example, uh, likelihood of coronary artery disease is higher, but invasive coronary angiography is not appropriate, and then, uh, then the non-invasive functional imaging would be uh, the next step to see if there is reversible ischemia. So if there is reversible myocardial ischemia, and then we treat it as stable angina. If, it, if there is no reversible myocardial ischemia, that means there is it, the chest pain is not explainable by myocardial ischemia. Then we investigate as a pain. Now, in the uh, in our case, in the uh, previous case, invasive uh, coronary angiography was done, and it showed fifty percent or more diameter stenosis in the left main coronary artery. So the question is: Is this significant coronary artery disease? And what do you do now? Now. Here, to say it is significant, there is a standard definition that is 70% or more diameter stenosis of at least one major epicardial artery segment or 50% or more diameter stenosis in the left main. This is uh, what is in, in the patient, in the, in the case scenario. So it is 50% or more diameter stenosis in the left main coronary artery disease. So it is a significant coronary artery disease. Here, we can probably look for other factors that in intensify ischemia or that reduce ischemia. For example, if somebody has anemia or if there is coronary spasm, it in intensifies as ischemia. So we have to, the, so we have to identify uh, patients with anemia and it has to be treated. Things that increase oxygen demand, like tachycardia or uh, LV hypertrophy, also in intensify ischemia. The other is uh, if there is large mass of ischemic myocardia, like proximal located lesions. So, or probably we can also determine the extent of ischemia based on the uh, non-invasive functional imaging. And if it is longer lesion and uh, length on uh, on coronary angiography that also intensifies ischemia. There are factors that reduce ischemia, like if there is well-developed collateral supply and a small mass of ischemic myocardium, of course, this will lower or reduce the ischemia. Uh, in, now, if invasive coronary angiography, and, now, and then we uh, determine the significance if it is significant, the next is now treating it as stable angina of investigating other causes. If it is uncertain, uh, even after uh, invasive coronary ang angiography is done, and you can't determine whether the, uh, the, the degree of stenosis is, does not uh, classify the patient into significant coronary artery disease, the next step is again to do the non-invasive functional imaging. So these are the, just to repeat it, these are the stress echocardiography, the nuclear imagings like myocardial perfusion scintigraphy, and the third is MR, uh, cardiac MR. 
to see if there is reversible myocardial ischemia. Now, if there is reversible myocardial ischemia, of course, that indicates that, that uh, the chest pain is because of uh, the significant uh, ischemia and it has to be treated as stable angina or in those already on treatment and then it is re-intensifying the treatment. Uh, if not, then we look still for other cause of chest pain. Now, this, is, this summarizes the approach to the uh, or the diagnostic, uh, the different diagnostic modalities in somebody uh, in basically on the non invasive testing. Uh, so, if the clinical likelihood is low and, and uh, if there is no previous history of coronary artery disease, then coronary CT is the preferred modality. And based on the ongoing symptoms, uh, patients can proceed to coronary angiography and in between uh, after drug treatment and the degree of stenosis and uh, the degree of uh, significance, then functional assessment can be done uh, to decide whether patient benefits from revascularization or not. If the, the clinical likelihood is high and then uh, the preferred modality would be the non-invasive uh, functional testes like the, the stress echo, the myocardial perfusion scintigraphy, and the, the MR are preferred if the clinical likelihood is, uh, is higher. Now, after uh, diagnosing stable angina, and then the next treatment, uh, I mean, the next step would be, of course, uh, management. And uh, so this include advising the patient and uh, providing information and support, general principles like the lifestyle change, short acting nitrates, uh, optimal drug treatment for the angina, secondary preventions of cardiovascular disease, and whether to use uh, beta blockers or calcium channel blockers and other anti-anginal anti drugs as stress line treatment. And then we reassessing if there is satisfactory control and the medications are tolerated. So this uh, algorithm summarizes our approach to the treatment of patients with stable angina. Now the information and support, of course, there are lists of information that uh, should be included in the advice. Like, uh, for example, explaining what stable angina is and factors that provoke uh, and management or the course of the illness needs to be explained to the patient. And, and the other is the importance of follow-up is also something to be stressed. And the purpose, risks, and benefits of treatment. And, and the other is lifestyle advice included in the advice, information, and support. The other is lifestyle recommendations like smoking cessation, and the use of the importance of healthy diet and what they mean, uh, activity like moderate physical activity on most of the days of the week. Uh, in somebody who, who can't do that, even irregular activities also beneficial. And the other is the importance of uh, weight control and the other medication, sexual activities. This need to be included in the lifestyle recommendations. And uh, this summarizes what healthy diet is, like increasing consumption of fruits and vegetables and more of fiber diet. And, and this just lists the importance of diets and uh, whether amount of alcohol and uh, the importance. Uh, this is like for, for the, the strengths of, I mean, the, the class of recommendation in the lifestyle management. This is just to show it. So after advice and lifestyle modifications uh, are dealt with, then what are the medications that we give uh, patients stable, stable angina? One is short acting nitrates. Now uh, we need to educate or at least provide information on what they are and the side effects and when they are to be used, like uh, to repeat doses after five minutes if the pain has not gone, and uh, if there is no improvement after second dose to, to seek for, uh, like, I mean, patients have to be advised on the need to uh, seek uh, expert management or, or to contact the doctors or health, health facilities. Uh, 
And the optimal drug treatment is uh, either to provide one or two antianginal drugs. And uh, the aim of uh, antianginal drugs is to prevent episodes of angina. And here, the secondary prevention uh, modalities are also included. The aim is to prevent cardiovascular events uh, or future cardiovascular events that, uh, such as heart attack and, and stroke. And then side effects of drugs are to be discussed here. And then reviewing treatment uh, response, uh, including any side effects, uh, basic, preferably to two or four weeks after starting the treatment. And whether need also to, mod to modify the dosage. And this, the drugs that are included in the secondary prevention are aspirin, AC inhibitors for people with stable angina, diabetes, and other conditions like hypertension, statins, and treatment for uh, uh, high blood pressure. Uh, these are uh, what are included in the secondary prevention of future cardiovascular events. Uh, and then uh, after we have provided the uh, short-acting nitrates and uh, advice patients on their importance and treatment for antianginal drugs and uh, secondary prevention. So antianginal drugs are the beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and other uh, antianginal drugs based on uh, on the condition of the patient. And then we have to assess whether the patient is tolerating the medications or responding satisfactory, uh, satisfactorily to the treatment. Now in the previous patient uh, or the, the clinical scenario, uh, patient was put on calcium channel blocker and beta blockers, but she, she, she couldn't tolerate it. So uh, what's the next step? Now, if somebody is put on beta blockers and cal or calcium channel blockers and cannot tolerate them, so we go for uh, next uh, step. If it is well controlled, of course, the discussion is on uh, further um, on discussion of prognosis and the importance of further investigation, like the importance of uh, probably angiography to determine whether. Uh, the extent of the coronary artery disease and uh, the future need for, uh, for revascularization and the importance of non-invasive ana anatomical tests or functional tests. And if it is not controlled, uh, and then uh, we see now somebody on beta blocker and, or calcium channel blocker, uh, if it is tolerated but symptom not controlled, the other clinical scenario is contraindicated or not tolerated. And the, the other is both or either of the drugs. So, uh, so uh, if it is not uh, well controlled, uh, so if patient is on one of the drugs, beta blocker or calcium channel blocker, we add, uh, so uh, if somebody is on beta blocker, we add calcium channel blocker. And the third antianginal drug is added only if two of them, both beta blockers and calcium channel blockers, do not control the symptoms. And, the, and so this indicates that the patient might need uh, revascularization. So patient can be given the third antianginal drugs while waiting for the revascularization. Uh, if it is contraindicated or not tolerated, and, and then we go for the other antianginal drugs. These are the long-acting nitrates or evabradine or uh, nicorandil or uh, ranolazine and other antianginal drugs uh, is then considered. Uh, this is in those patients who, who don't tolerate it. Now, in the clinical scenario, a patient was uh, put on optimal uh, drug treatment and because the patient couldn't tolerate beta blockers and, uh, bet, uh, and calcium channel blockers, so another antianginal drug was given, but patient did not respond. So what, what would be the, the next intervention? Now in such patients, uh, and then revascularization has to be considered. 
So after optimal uh, medical therapy, uh, the next step is uh, if there is no response, then revascularization is now uh, considered and uh, coronary angiography has a place. Uh, additional non-invasive or invasive uh, functional testing may be needed in such patients uh, because the importance of uh, revascularization is if there is reverse, reversible ischemia. Otherwise, if somebody has uh, myocardial infarction, previous infarction, and, and no reversible ischemia, and there is no point on, on revascularization uh, in, in such cases. Uh, and now let's say revascularization was done in the, in the patient, for the patient, and it did not still control the symptoms. Now, the, what would you do? So that would be the next step. Uh, now here, uh, it needs discussion with the patient on, on, on exploring patient's understanding of the patient and, and, and impact of symptoms on quality of life and considering non ischemic cause of pain other causes, other non-coronary, uh, I mean, other pain, cause of pain that uh, are non-cardiac, or reviewing drug treatment, uh, like for uh, compliance of the patient to the treatment regimen. And then uh, the other is if these all are uh, uh, well in place, then limitations of further treatment need to be discussed and how patients can manage their, their pain themselves. And the other is considering cardiac syndrome X. This is uh, uh, actually cardiac syndrome X is in people who have angenal symptoms, but uh, angiography is normal. Uh, like in these patients, uh, drug treatment for stable angina, uh, if symptoms are improving, needs to be continued. Uh, but they may not require drugs for secondary prevention. So normal coronary arteries with uh, cardiac syndromics and uh, also the, if the functional imaging uh, do not show any sign of ischemia, probably as long as the treatment controls the, the angina, it would be continued, but they, there is no benefit from the secondary prevention modalities. So that's what I have, but just to summarize, so the European Society of Cardiology sum summarizes into steps. So the first, what we did was assessing the symptoms and performing investigations, then comorbidities and quality of life, and then I mean, the investigations like resting ECG, the biochemical test, the chest X-ray and select patients, and echocardiography, and assessing pretest probability and the, the likelihood of clinical, uh, I mean, coronary artery disease, and then, we, based on the clinical likelihood, the next step is to go for either the anatomic non-invasive Im imaging like coronary CT, or if the, the, if the likelihood is, is higher, then uh, proceeding with the functional imaging. And if it is very high, of course, patients might require angiography, uh, invasive angiography. And then the other step is choosing appropriate therapy based on uh, the symptoms and event risk. And we have also tried to summarize the anti-anginal drugs, when to use uh, this, when to add, like, I mean, in, in addition to the beta blocker or calcium channel blocker, uh, when to consider uh, the third anti-anginal uh, drug or, or other anti-anginal drugs as alternatives. That's what I have. If there is any question, uh, anything that's not clear. So I basically, refer, I mean, um, focused on the approach and not on on the uh, the scientific evidence. Okay, if there is any question. Can I ask, sorry? Yes, yes, Dr. Wanda. Yeah. Thank you. When the, in, in HIV is now known, a risk factor. Okay. Established. So, in the risk calculation, uh, when you, you know where the pretest probability was computed, so yeah. diseases like HIV were 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 taken into consideration or not? Thanks. Uh, HIV is no, uh, it's, it is not directly considered, but uh, in HIV patients, uh, of course, there is uh, like dyslipidemia. Uh, and is or the, the risk factors I think are uh, considered as 
are indirectly considered probably in increasing the likelihood of uh, coronary artery disease. So it is more of the, uh, the risk factors uh, that are prevalent in the HIV patients uh, rather than the infection itself. Or probably if there is anything you can add. <laughs> but in the risk classification, there is, it is not considered as, as uh, an entity. Yeah. Other than... <laughs> probably the cases are fewer in Europe and in America. Right. But uh, drugs and the state of uh, chronic inflammation and unregulated yeah. uh, you know, immune activation are, are very well known risk right. factors. But I can't tell you the odds ratio. Like you can you can you, you can tell about the odds ratio with smoking hypertension, diabetes, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Very difficult to tell the old ratio. However, it is, yeah. it, it has become really very clear for, for those of us who are practicing oh. with HIV that it's, it's really a risk factor. Yeah, uh, I, I, I agree. So in HIV patients, the dyslipidemia and the, the drug treatment probably might add, I mean, those add to the Likely is a clinical likelihood. Yeah, I also agree with, with Dr. Wonders. Okay. Okay. Any other question? Okay, so Dr. Yirnakacho. Uh... Yes, doctor. Yes, yes. So uh, thank you for the very informative lecture. So uh, uh, we will uh, have uh, evaluation of two internists. So we'll do it uh, briefly. Uh, 